Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you never know what's going to happen next at the CFZ. My name's John Downs and welcome to another episode of On the Crack. We built up another trail town where we found the disco from back in January on Common Moor. There have been reports of mysterious animals which sound very much like big cats of an unknown species in this part of Devon for many years. And one of the places that they've been reported most of all is here at Common Moor, a stretch of publicly owned land between Woolsey and Cheviot. As regular viewers will know, back in January we retrieved the skeleton of a young roe deer from this stretch of road. The skeleton showed unmistakable signs of having been predated and we had first hoped that it had been killed and eaten by a big cat, although now it seems that the signs of predation are actually from a large fox. The first time we set trail cameras up on the stretch of road, we actually got a picture of a very large dog fox marching up and down the main road. And we wondered when we set up the cameras for a second time, would we get more pictures of him? No, we didn't, but we did get proof that despite this place being the location for the last moments and rather grisly and dismembering of one of their number, this is still a track path where roe deer cross the road from one side to the other and into the moorland beyond. So, what's going to happen next? Well, it's certain that our investigations here at Common Moor will continue and we'll let you know as soon as we have anything to tell you. Watch this space. Once upon a time, on a classic English sunny day of the sort, we fought two world wars against Johnny Foreigner in order to protect. A train was travelling from one place to another place. And on that train was a young lady who was one of those classic English roses. Then, all of a sudden... Laugh! It's Bigfoot! No, it's not, said the man sitting opposite her. It's a badly animated CGI chicken. And he was quite right, because men of his calibre are quite easily able to recognise badly animated CGI chickens when they see them. But all his protestations were to no avail, because, as the classic English Rose explained calmly, it was her right as a woman to be able to see Bigfoot if she wanted, and for anybody to deny her that right would be sexist. And as none of the people in the carriage wanted to be seen as sexist, even though none of them had actually seen the badly animated CGI chicken, they all agreed with her. And everybody, except for the man sitting opposite the English Rose, lived happily ever after. What is Carl doing up a tree with a chainsaw? And earlier, what was he doing up a ladder? Was he only up there to drop a cuddly black panther on Charlotte's head in order to make a stupid visual gag in order to open this episode? No, we're in the process of carrying out the biggest overhaul of the CFZ grounds since we moved here 13 years ago. Because of the activities of our erstwhile colleagues who conned Karina and me out of a large amount of money, the last few years, Graham has spent rebuilding my house in Exeter and making it fit for human habitation. 
and so I'm afraid we have been neglecting the CFZ grounds and garden. So in that time the trees have become very overgrown and there's very little light reaching the ground in parts of the grounds. Add to that the change in weather patterns. When the garden was laid out by my late father, he did it for long, hot, dry British summers. And as you know, we've had short, cold, wet British summers most of the time for the last 10 years. Add to that the fact that we've got two dogs, one of whom, Prudence, is about the size and shape of a small pygmy hippopotamus. And both dogs like running around on the lawns and cause havoc to the wet surface. And so on occasion in the last few years our lawns, what used to be my mother's lawn she used to sit on in long hot summer afternoons, has looked a bit like one of the less salubrious bits of the battlefield of the Somme. Also remember that for years the CSZ year was based around the annual summer weird weekend and we had to keep the main lawn empty so we could then put a marquee up and so the great and the good of British Fortiana could come and drink tequila in there. But that too has gone the way of all flesh and these days the big lawn is home to some rescued battery chickens. And so we are reorganising the grounds, so they'll be better for wet weather, they'll be more useful for the way that we do things now, but it's still optimised for a wildlife garden, which is still our major goal. And what's changed? Well, we now have a tenant in my house in Exeter, most of Graham's building work has been finished to everybody's satisfaction. I've got income coming in from the house in Exeter so I can afford to spend some money on things for a change. And we also now have the addition of Carl Marshall to the team. And Carl, being much younger than Karina Graham and me, is still enthusiastic, energetic and able to do all the physical stuff, especially climbing trees, that Graham is getting a bit too old to do and that I haven't been able to do in years. So what's this space? Well I sincerely hope that everybody watching this realises that whatever work we do on the CFZ trees and whatever branches we have to cut down is purely because we're trying to optimise the CFZ grounds for wildlife. However, in recent months we've become aware of the scandal that's taking place in Sheffield where trees are being cut down willy-nilly for, it appears, purely sordid financial gain. And so because we're seriously shocked by this, we phoned up our old friend Steve Andrews, otherwise known as the Bard of Ely, to talk to him about what's going on in Sheffield and what you can do to help prevent it. Well, the, the trees in Sheffield is just one of the other uh, campaigns going on. What, what actually happened with me is that uh, I was in Cardiff, which is where I come from originally, and um, there's a tree protest was going on there. Anyway, uh, yeah, there, there was a, a protest going on there to save Roth Brook trees, and um, I thought, okay, I'll go along to that, and I, I'd been communicating with some of the protesters there on Twitter, and I went along, I took my guitar, and uh, they have kingfishers living there, like, um, on the, uh, the stream, uh, Roth Brook, and also water bowls, and yes, yeah, so I went along there, and uh, I did some songs. I did a song of mine called Kingfisher, and there was somebody there that interviewed me. And uh, I also, uh, you may know, I, I, I did a cover of Stand By Me, and I changed it to Stand By Tree, which went down very well. And uh, yeah, I was on Britain's Got Talent, um, in fact, like last year, doing a cover of Stand By Me. But so I, I'm known for doing this song. But I'm, I'm doing now, like, Stand By Tree. And also, what's uh, happened in the last few weeks is um, I've got into doing, all we are saying is give trees a chance, you know, to the, the John Lennon and Yoko Ono um, with that song, you know, Give Peace a Chance. But getting back to what, what we were talking about, about the, um, the Sheffield one, I, uh, 
Um, I, I have friends in Sheffield. Uh, one, one guy, Paul Rance, I've known for years, he used to run Peace and Freedom fanzine. And uh, Paul uh, has been, like, you know, talking to me on Twitter a lot and posting a lot. And, and uh, I, so I, I got involved in that one as well. And uh, the more I get involved in trying to save the trees, the more I'm finding out that there are more trees in danger throughout the UK. And it's absolutely appalling that there's trees in Brighton, there's trees in London, there's trees in Liverpool. And it's all insane. Because it's all, as far as I can see, is just to make money. There's this big um, company in, in Sheffield, Amy PLC, and they are taking trees out left, right, and center. We're talking about thousands. And uh, often there's nothing wrong with the trees. You know, they're perfectly healthy. And they've got like a list of why they can get rid of the trees. If they're diseased, if they're dead, if they're dying. Also discriminatory. They can um, discriminate against the trees, it appears. And uh, the residents there are so upset about this. There's people who have been living with a tree outside their house for, you know, maybe a very, very long time. And they are seeing these trees being chopped down. And they were all being out in the street protesting and trying to get in the way. And it, it's got completely and utterly insane. They're having, like, lots of police uh, uh, are um, helping the... Uh, well, not helping the protesters, they're helping the, the Amy PLC uh, tree uh, fellers uh, who are trying to, to chop these trees down. And uh, I think there's been as many as like 32 police all, you know, um, for one tree. This is how insane it's got, yeah? And uh, there's been arrests and um, protesters have been hurt. The whole thing is completely mad there. This new segment was Charlotte's idea, as was the title, with people in the CFZ spread far and wide across the globe and of all ages from their teens to their 80s. Everyone has a different opinion of their favourite mystery animals. And so now each episode we are asking a different crypto authority for their favourites. And as Charlotte said, it's time for the Crypto's Cryptids. My favourite cryptozoological animal isn't really an animal, but more of a concept. The idea of well-known underwater animals being much larger and much more vicious down in the depths. This applies to most things, but particularly animals like sharks, eels, whales, and other kinds of sea animals. I also like nannies and catfish, and the best of all cryptozoological. Well, I don't know about you, but I enjoyed that. I wonder who we're going to choose next time. We've got to tune in and find out. I hereby pronounce a legal judgment that it is not appropriate for the makers of this program to refer to their next guest as Baldy the Bandicoot. A few weeks ago, Nick Redfern wrote an article for the Mysterious Universe website about how reality TV is damaging the future of cryptozoology. We agreed with him, but some people got angry about it. So we called him up to ask him about his opinions. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote an article for Mysterious Universe on the future of cryptozoology. But it wasn't an article from the perspective of um, how cryptozoology per se would be affected in the future or would be changed. The article was written from the perspective of how reality TV or unreality TV um, is impacting on cryptozoology and impacting in a very negative way. And I think some people who read the article misunderstood it. Uh, I didn't realize necessarily what I was saying because I wasn't being critical of the field of cryptozoology or the people within cryptozoology, what I was actually doing was pointing out that the reality TV shows, most of them of which are faked, at the very least, um, because so many people watch them, what happens is that 
the people who watch those shows get the image of what cryptolo cryptozoology is from those shows. And, and certainly that's the case in the general public because I know from speaking to them that um, their, their views or, you know, their um, approach to cryptozoology doesn't come largely from books. It comes from watching these shows. And that was the point I was getting across is that cryptozoology is sort of being altered um, in a negative way because of the impact of these shows and the fact that a lot of them at their height had large audience figures, you know. I know I've had, because as you know, I have quite a regular stream of students, both uh, college students and university students, come here to do placements. And on quite a few occasions in the last five, six years, I've had students who've got interested in cryptozoology from watching reality TV and been incredibly disappointed that the CFC don't spend their whole time wearing camouflage gear with paint on, paint on our faces, running around the woods going, there's a squash in that forest, and then setting off smoke bombs. <laughs> no, that's exactly the, the point I wanted to make. And I, I think what a lot of people in cryptozoology don't recognize um, is, the, is the fact that those shows really do create, uh, like a, a, in a negative way, a solid impression of what TV wants um, cryptozoology to be. I think from these shows, um, some people get the, the idea that if you're sort of involved in cryptozoology and doing investigations and expeditions, you know, it's all sort of uh, Indiana Jones type expeditions meets Jurassic Park or something like that. But it's actually not, as you know. I mean, a lot of it is sort of doing basic research first before you go out on an expedition. And then, you know, when you do go to these places, I mean, very often it's, it's a case of doing witness interviews, going out to locations, but not rampaging through the woods, you know, um, thinking that you're going to come across this or that. Because, as you know, that, that isn't how it, how it works. It's a lot more down to earth. But the problem is, reality TV does not want down to earth. Reality TV wants, as you said, guys running through the woods, you know, night scopes, what the hell was that? And, um, you know, some roaring noises in the background, which have clearly been put there by the special effects people and not anything that was ever recorded, you know, actually in the field, so to speak. And, and, and I think the most disturbing thing about this is that, you know, in every respect of life, you know, television does impact on us and does sway our opinions, you know, on the news about this or that. And in relation to cryptozoology, it's no difference. Um, if you sit down, you know, you remember the public sits down, watches a crypto show, about this creature or that creature, they don't just get information from these shows on the relevant creatures. They find their, um, I guess, their opinions on what um, defines cryptozoology. They start to develop in a way that's actually very different from the real picture. So that's what I was pointing out in the article. The power of television can actually dictate to some degree, aspects of the future of cryptozoology. And the main area, I think, that it will dictate change is, is, the, is the perception of cryptozoologists themselves. You know, I mean, for, for most of these um, reality TV shows, you know, the, all the, the characters within them have their own nickname. You know, one dresses like this, one dresses like that. And... Um, you know, it's all about running around, etc., etc., and they become characters. And yes, TV shows need characters, but I don't really, I never really understand with these shows why they need to fabricate it. Why don't they just use the real people, and you know, who are experts in the field? And I think if they did that, even if an expedition was far more low key. I think it would be much better in the long term for the 
viewing public and for the media and and for cryptozoology because like I said TV really does sway a lot of people it is that powerful and I think a lot of people in cryptozoology forget that they think that the public gets their um, info on Bigfoot from surfing around the net yeah like now, and a lot of people do but equally a lot of people sit down on a Friday night you know and watch a monster show and they think that's what it is and um and if it did sort of have a, a deeper impact on cryptozoology in terms of how it's perceived, I think that would be, you know, a bad thing and a, and a tragic thing, really. And now it's time for a brand new feature for the show. It's time for On The Track Product Placement. There are all sorts of people who are friends and relations of the CFZ and people who are members of the CFZ themselves who do all sorts of peculiar things. And now, each episode, we're going to give a brief roundup of some of these aforementioned things. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the latest issue, a double issue of Animals and Men, issue 64 stroke 65, has just come out and is free to read via the CFZ website and blog pages. It includes articles on blue dogs, man beasts, mystery cats, aquatic monsters, new and rediscovered, 21st century sea serpents, the water of the skies, giant shark reports, and mermaids in the Dutch tradition by Lois Moderman, as well as a report of the second Weird Weekend North, letters to the editor, and book reviews. And it's free. You can't argue with that, can you? And here, my sultry assistant, the lovely Karina, is modelling the latest exquisite collection from Richard Muirhead. The latest edition of Flying Snake includes Dr. Devo's Diary, Richard Muirhead on Strange Clouds and some Monster Toad stories, the first Spanish alien big cat, Unknown Water Spider in Uganda, The Magic Zoo of Lake Lugano, Stella's Sea Cow, an update, The Baby at the Desert, no, sorry, The Baby of the Desert, Law of the Bear Lake Monster, a mystery animal photo found on eBay, and those ever-enigmatic cetaceans. As well as notes and queries, letters, and all sorts of other goodies for your delectation. You want a copy? Contact Richard on his page on Facebook. And now it's time to go to Karina for our monthly visit to the Watch of the Skies. I have always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird. A highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other Old World raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have. And that's what this segment on the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals. And in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the watcher of the skies. Hundreds of miles from its natural home 
a rare, possibly juvenile, masked booby was sighted off the Southern California coast during May. This species <laughs> with a body around three inches larger than that of the California seagull is commonly found in tropical oceans, its territory being below the 30th parallel near ba Baja and in the southern hemisphere. The adult class booty is almost totally bright white with a dark face mask. So the face is the shape of the The bill is yellow, while the bare skin around the face and throat is black. The wings and tail are brown black and the individual feathers are dark with white faces and sharks and the underwing is white. A bittern has been heard on the Isle of Wight, at RSPB braiding marshes for the first time. This is good news for the species after numbers fell to just 11 males in 1997, although the species is now recovering with the help of intensive conservation efforts. Bitterns are secretive and spend most of their time living within dense weeds, making them hard to count. But the loud and distinctive booming call of breeding males is used as a measure of the population. However, despite their revival, there are still less than 200 bitterns at fewer than 75 sites in the UK, making the first record on the Isle of Wight very special. Please, prudence, stop gobbing on my leg. It is hoped this male will manage to attract a mate, and that the pair would breed on the reserve, which will be another first of the island. Bitterns were once prized in medieval banquets and were considered extinct as a breeding species in the UK by the 1870s. <coughs> they recolonised the UK in the early 20th century, with a peak of around 80 booming males in the 1950s. They saw numbers slide so they were facing extinction again with just 11 males, mainly in Norfolk and Suffolk. There was a rare sighting of a snowy owl near Boston in Lincolnshire at the beginning of May at RSBB Frampton Marsh. It is suspected to be the same snowy owl seen at Rainfleet Marsh in March, which was the, uh, that's the place March, not the month of March, I think. Well, it could be in March. Not too sure. March is in This is going to be easy. Anyway, it was seen at Wayfleet Marsh in March, which was the first for the county since the early 90s, and prior to that since 1869. The snowy owl is native to Arctic regions in North America and Eurasia, and is a ground nester that primarily hunts for rodents and waterfowl, opportunistically in this area. It is also, unlike most owls, active during the day, especially in the summertime when the weather is high. Is that right? And the living is easy. A duckling belonging to one of the rarest and most endangered species of birds in the world has recently hatched in Sussex at the Wildfowl and Threatened Trust Centre in Arundel. Named Louis, the white headed duck set to the main trust's main duffery at WWT Stinbridge Wetlands Centre in Gloucestershire. Why to dream? Duckery, yes, it's brilliant here, isn't it? Eventually, Louis may return to live at WWT Arundel, where his parents live in the reed swamp, Gibbet found a wetland centre with other ducks from Kazakhstan, Turkey, Iran and Afghanistan. 
The white-headed duck breeds in Spain and North Africa, with a large population in Western Central Asia. Individuals are fairly frequently reported well north of their breeding range, but as with, as with many wildfowl, the status of these extra limited records is clouded by the possibility of escapes from collections. A rare green heron, native to North and Central America, has been spotted in Wales, what is believed to be only the second time. The bird turned up in a garden in Clan Mill near Narborough, Pembrokeshire. The birds were about 40 centimetres, which in old language is 60 inches, tall, much smaller than the grey herons that are more commonly seen in the UK and are a brown and green colour. They normally live on the other side of the Atlantic and are widespread across their native countries of the United States and southern Canada. It is thought that the bird was likely to have ended up in Wales after being blown off course by recent westerly winds. It is that time of year when birds make nests, if not art, as such a lease for human places. There has been a story of a couple of Essex birds having taken up residence in the pub at Popford, where two blue tits made a nest in the pub cigarette box and successfully hatched four chicks inside. There's also been a story or two about nests being found in car engines. But there is also the tale of a pair of Cumbria blackbirds, who made not one, but ten nests side by side on the rungs of a ladder. Apparently this unusual behaviour occurs when blackbirds, along with a few other species, fail to cope with the problem caused by the ladder, which forms identical holes, each one equally suitable for nesting. They are unable to choose between one hole and another, so in a state of confusion, they start to build nests in each. Along with blackbirds, this behaviour has also been spotted in other garden birds, such as robins, chaffinch and swallows. And that, dear friends, is it for this issue episode. And now, it's over to Jonathan for this month's <laughs> episode of You and Me Discovered. Thank you. Goodbye. The genus Kinosternin in Mexico is represented by 12 species, of which only two inhabit the lowlands of the Central Pacific region. Based on 15 standard morphological attributes and coloration patterns of nine individuals, a new microendemic mud turtle species from the Central Pacific versions of Mexico has been described. The suite of morphological traits exhibited clearly differentiated from other species within the genus Kenosternin by a combination of proportions of plastron and carapace scutes, body size and a large yellow rostral shield in males. The new species inhabit small streams and ponds in and near the city of Puerto Vallarta in Jalisco. Unfortunately, natural populations are unknown so far. The habitat is damaged by urban growth and only one female is known. The available information would suggest that Kinostern and Vogti is one of the most threatened freshwater turtle species on the planet and an urgent conservation program is necessary as well as explorations in the area to find viable populations of the species. Australabius vici is a new species of killifish described from seasonal ponds in the Bermejo River Basin in the western Chacoan district in northwestern Argentina. The species was found in a single pond, a paleo channel of the Bermejo River, which is seriously disturbed by soybean plantations surrounding it. Despite intensive sampling in the area, the species was only registered in this one pond where it was relatively scarce. Therefore, we consider this species as critically endangered. This species is the sister species of A. patriciae in the phylogenetic analyses and is similar in a general external aspect to A. veraceae and A. cavalry. It can be distinguished amongst the species of Australabius by its unique colour pattern in males.
a new species of microhylid frog, Microhylocadia, from the west coast of India has been described in a new paper. It is distinct from all described species of microhyla occurring in South and Southeast Asia as revealed by a combination of morphological, molecular and acoustic characters. This new species is characterised by an absence of a lateral body stripe, tuberculated dorsal skin surface, absence of webbing between the fingers, presence of basal webbing between toes, and absence of dorsal marginal groove on finger and toe discs. Each male advertisement call lasts for 0.11 to 0.42 seconds and is comprised of 2 to 7 pulses with a dominant frequency of 3.3 to 4.2 kHz. The breeding season is short, limited only to the rainy season, June to September, and the females lay up to 300 eggs per clutch. A new species of tree frog, Gracilaxis guandongensis, is described based on a series of specimens collected from Dwawalung Forest Station, Mount Nankun and Nanling Nature Reserve of Guangdong Province, southeastern China. The new species is distinguished from all known congeners by a significant genetic divergence. A new species of Amphis banid has been described from the Brazilian Amazon within the area impacted by the Teles Pires hydroelectric power plant in the Jacarianga municipality in the state of Para. Amphis hugmodi is known so far only for the type locality on the right bank of the river. According to the Worldwide Fund for Nature in 2016, the region covering the area of the hydroelectric power plant consists of tropical and subtropical moist deciduous forests, an ecoregion of tropical dry forest with a variety of habitats, alluvial forests and patches of open areas. The new species was collected in the rainforest submontane, rainforest alluvial and semi-deciduous forest submontane. A new species of the armoured catfish genus Corridorus is described from the Zingo Tabachos ecoregion in the Brazilian Amazon. Specimens of Corridorus benetati were found in lotic habitats in the Rio Culueni, Rio Zingu Basin, and Rio Brasho Norte, tributary to the Rio Pioxoto de Alvedo, Rio Tabachos Basin. Both localities have muddy brown water with clay and sandy substrata. Most specimens were captured in the small forest streams of black or clear water or in marginal ponds. The specific name Benatati honours the late Leat Benati for his humanitarian work providing fresh water from artesian wells to poor communities in Brazil. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. Well, we never did get around to hearing of any of Graham's adventures whilst he was in Arizona. This was partly because we've been brushed off our feet with all sorts of things, which also you'll hear about next time, and also because he took so much footage he just hasn't yet been able to process it all. So, once again, watch this space and hopefully we'll get around to it next month. Ever since we restarted this show back in the summer, we've been telling you how Louis was going to set up a Patreon campaign. Well, he's done it. And you can come, see what he's done, and hopefully support us in a very real way at this address. Thank you, guys. Thank you for watching this month's episode, and we hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to click that like button, to subscribe, and to click the bell so you get notified whenever we upload a new video. And be sure to share this video on social media. Thank you, and goodbye! Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we've enjoyed putting it together. I'm particularly pleased with this episode because as well as bringing you the lighter and heavier side of cryptozoology around the world, we have 
addressed a couple of what I believe to be quite important issues, and we shall continue to do this as and when the need arises. Thank you very much to all of you who support us each month on our Patreon account, and who support the ZSZ in other ways from month to month. We really are grateful and we wouldn't be able to do it without you. We've got some exciting stuff coming up, including Richard and Chris Clark, off to what used to be Soviet Central Asia, in search of the Almasty and other mystery primates. And I believe that we've got something big for it like coming up in the Pacific Northwest before the end of the year. So, all sorts of good stuff happening, and we'll keep you abreast of the news as quickly and as easily as we can. So, until next time, be seeing you. Thank you.